John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, good afternoon well, to you, John. Hey, Todd. How are you today? Not bad at all. Once again, it's just the two of us. And as usual, with uh, Greg not here, we can uh, do things that uh, probably wouldn't be the kind of thing that Greg would want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we might. We might. And, well, uh, you know, we had a very interesting event here in the last week with the Delta Airlines flight where a passenger got himself uh, ill. I don't know if he was ill before he got on the airplane or, you know, was he eating and drinking in the in the terminal before he left and had a reaction. But in, in any event, he had uh, a lot of distress, gastro distress, and... Uh, so bad that he had to turn the airplane around and come back because he had, he lost control of his his uh, bowels. Well, a little bit of background on this particular flight. This was an international flight going from Atlanta to Europe on a Delta A350. And they were about two hours into the flight before they had to turn around and come back to Atlanta. So uh, this gastrointestinal distress, which apparently was, uh, I won't go into details. You can find it online. It was throughout the cabin of the aircraft. So whatever was happening, the passenger was in motion at some point. And so the passengers were exposed to this for two hours and they had to come back. Um, the passenger was treated. The plane was, uh, the, the crew and the passengers went to another plane. They eventually got to the destination. But this, uh, outside of the uh, you know, obvious uh, attraction this has for the media, this brings up some particular issues when it comes to pilots of general, general aviation aircraft and pilots of smaller aircraft beyond airliners, not just from a passenger perspective, but from the flight crew perspective. If you're in an aircraft and you're responsible for flying in that aircraft or flying that aircraft rather, and you think you have a potential issue, you have to seriously think, should I even fly? Now, in the case of this passenger, this person, whoever this person was, thought that they could make it across the ocean. They were wrong. And as a result, there was all sorts of uh, things that happened. If you're flying the airplane itself and you have a potential medical issue, gastrointestinal, whatever the case may be, um, there may not be any recourse to quickly deal with this. Because even in a best case situation, let's say you're just doing you know, takeoff and landing practice in the, in the pattern, it could be five or 10 minutes before you can safely put that airplane on the ground and shut the engine down and get out of the aircraft and take care of whatever the issue is. So uh, this is something that, again, uh, it may have caused problems in the past. And John, you've had much more experience than I uh, dealing with executive aircraft and smaller aircraft operations, GA operations. Uh, what kind of experiences have you seen where a passenger recruitment person had some sort of, let's say, gastrointestinal distress and put the uh, flight at risk? Well, you know, I fly every week. I'm flying virtually every week. 44, 46 weeks a year. And uh, only once did I have an experience with somebody that had a similar problem. And that was contained to the uh, one of the laboratories, but the problem was, was uh, severe enough or bad enough or embarrassing enough that they ended up 
uh, blocking off that laboratory for the rest of the flight, and it was a long flight. So it, it does happen. Uh, you, know, you can't expect the flight attendants to uh, take care of the mess, so to speak. So, uh, you know, they get to close it off. And who knows what this guy was. Was it spread around the cabin because he was racing to try to get to the bathroom? Because suddenly he had this pressure build up. We'll never know because the press wouldn't report about that. But the fact is that you got to pay attention. You know, I've I've long told people, and my my wife, my kids, whenever we were flying, before we get on the airplane, go to the bathroom. You know, just so you don't have to get up, so you don't have that pressure in the event we have turbulence or whatever. You know, if you got to do something that's going to happen at the worst possible time, you know, the airplane is going to be. Uh, in a holding pattern and you can't get up. I've had that myself where I needed to go to the bathroom and we're in a holding pattern and it's, you know, you're, you're holding in the pattern that's holding the airplane and the seat belt has got you securely anchored. And, uh, you know, you'd love to be getting up and the flight attendant will scream at you if you start to get up. So it's, it, you've got to plan ahead if you're going to fly, whether in the front end of the airplane or the back end of the airplane. And like I said, for my wife and my kids, my family members, you know, go before we get on the airplane, take the, the maximum edge. Because what happens in an airport, especially today, with the, the, the delays that we get routinely during the day, you know, you're going to be sitting in the terminal, you're going to run in and try to get a, a hamburger or soda or something because there's no food on the airplanes. So you, you're going to be... Uh, increasing your intake at the terminal and that's going to have an effect on you on a half hour an hour or later so you got to think about that but uh, i can just only imagine how embarrassed this guy must have been a girl it, it had to be terrible for that person and never mind yeah, everybody yeah. that had to live with it in a less public situation again let's say again like i'm going to be doing next week I, let's say you're flying an aircraft for whatever reason. And you have to be very aware of your own limitations. If you know you have to take, I don't know, a dose of something at X number of hours later, and you think you might be delayed in, in starting the aircraft, take that into consideration. You might say to yourself, look, you know, I might be able to squeeze this in and get whatever dose I need in time. What if you don't? What if you have something, whatever the case may be, where if you don't take that dose at a regular time, it starts to have effect on your your balance, your decision-making, fatigue, what have you. And this isn't something to play with because, again, unlike a car where no matter where you are, no matter how fast you're driving, within 30 seconds, you can be at a full stop and take care of something or at a full stop and no longer driving. That is not the case in the air. And uh, this is where we segue into the main part of the show. It's another event where decision-making and circumstances played into a, a fatal event that killed 10 people. Uh, this is uh, also a celebrity event in that this is a 1991 crash of a uh, Hawker a 125 uh, twin engine jet that was carrying band members from uh, a country and Western uh, star Reba McIntyre's band. Individual pieces of the circumstance are not that spectacular. The airplane had nothing wrong with it. The flight crew, although the co-pilot, uh, apparently was not uh, typewriter in the aircraft. It's unclear to us whether this was, this was any kind of a violation because this was a Part 91 operation. Um, they were taking off late at night, so late that they were taking off from an unfamiliar airport near San Diego because the main San Diego airport had curfews in place. Uh, they were both unfamiliar, both the uh, pilot and, and co-pilot were unfamiliar with the air area. This was 1991, well before the era of foreflight. So uh, getting information, they had to rely on a flight service station uh, uh, to a person who was on duty at the time. And they, after the fact, that person said that they were both unfamiliar with the terrain. And to add uh, an issue to this, this was at night taking off from the San Diego area toward the northeast over mountains. And as you can see from the graphic we'll put up on the screen here, um, that part of Southern California, this is a graphic from a uh, satellite picture taken a few years ago, not 32 years ago when this event happened. To this day, there's still not much in the way of 
civilization in that mountainous part of California. So they're taking off at night, going toward the Northeast. There's not much in the way of reference points on the ground that they could see. The intention was to start with VFR, pick up an IFR clearance in route. And I don't know if I uh, have to emphasize this. They had an IFR clearance already, but because they were more than an hour and a half late getting off uh, from the aircraft, from the airport rather, that IFR, clear IFR clearance had lapsed. Literally, when the airplane had struck the mountain, the technician, the flight service station person on the, on the ground was inputting the new uh, IFR clearance. So a whole bunch of things conspired in a sense to put this crew in a position from which they couldn't recover. You know, it really is a shame. And I don't know when it all started, but that particular area in that airport has experienced a number of these kinds of crashes before with the rising terrain coming out of it. And as I remember, uh, they were either all at night. I think they were all at night. And when you're coming out of that airport to the Northeast, uh, uh, that's all national forest in. That's a lot of federal government property, so you're not going to see a lot of lights at the best set of circumstances. So it's and it's so close to the border. I mean, that airport is virtually on the border. It's about a mile off between the U.S. and Mexican border, and it's complicated because the Mexicans also have an airport just over the border, very close to that. So you, you've got the if if. Uh, space restrictions between uh, both towers. Uh, it's just, uh, it's a very difficult area. You know, and that airport's been around a long time. It was a military field, like almost all the airports in California, or at least Southern California. I mean, we trained, they built those airports in the 40s and 50s because it was wide open spaces and they could do a lot of training of, of military pilots, new training. and. Uh, you know, that, that those airports grew up out there. So it's not, not uncommon that, to fly airplanes into those mountains. That they're like 3,000 feet high around those airports. You got to be careful, especially at night. You know, in fact, you had, you had shared with me uh, uh, an experience you had right here in New England. Absolutely. This was uh, not in 1991, but in 2023. I was doing a short flight between uh, two airports in Massachusetts, well, actually from Massachusetts going over to uh, New Hampshire. And I looked at the uh, the charts before I, 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 I went and I was gonna be clear of any terrain by at least 800 feet. And it wasn't even a mountain or high terrain that was in my flight path. And I was flying at 4,500 feet and the highest terrain in the area was about 37, 3,800 feet. And I wasn't even flying over it. However, this was broad daylight, nice clear day. On the way over there, I can clearly see that there's a mountain in my way. And yes, I know the numbers said that I was going to be a mile or two away from the mountain and 800 feet above it, but uh, it made me kind of nervous. It's like, man, in my mind's eye, I didn't think this mountain would be so prominent. So uh, I thought to myself, what's the worst that can happen flying too close to high terrain like this? It was relatively flat around this mountain. It was sort of like sticking out on its own. And I thought, well, if there's wind coming over in a way that not is not forecast or that picks up, we could have some sort of turbulence effects on the on the uh, downwind side of that. So I uh, altered my course and put even more distance between myself and the mountain. But that just shows the, up the fact that you have to do your work, your research, your homework on whatever you're flying to. And if you see situations or circumstances change, make a change so that there's less of a threat or less of a perceived threat. Because I made that alteration in my route, I quit worrying about it and I focus on the rest of the flight. At night, in a mountainous area where there are no lights around, you don't have that luxury. Yeah, you never would have seen it. So you would have felt it probably with, with, the, uh, with the turbulence, the you know, little effect of wind on your, on your airplane. But yeah, it's it's something that all pilots have to be concerned about. And as I preach at the end of the show, free plan, free plan, free plan. Know what you're going. Know what's in between where you are, where you're going, and everything in between. Now, so, we have pulled out this uh, particular accident, not because we wanted to illustrate this particular set of flight risks, but because 
This is one of our occasional uh, shows where we focus on some celebrity celebrity related event. Not that the uh, events that lead up to a crash are any different than from a non-celebrity, but because it's a, a celebrity, excuse me, because it's a celebrity, more of a likelihood that the audience that we had would have heard about this. And even if you've never read the accident report, which literally I didn't read it until yesterday, um, if this spurs you to look it up and maybe learn a thing or two from it, we've done our job. And by the way, this was in 1991. This is before the modern era of uh, having a whole lot of data to back up an accident report. So although there is an accident report in the NTSB database, there's no public docket, there's no photographs, there's no uh, data from any sort of electronics that were on the aircraft. And there is no radar uh, tapes or anything like that. So all we have is a two or three page written account from which we can get information and insights. Had this event happened in 2023 and not 1991, at the very least, we would have had a whole lot of ADSB data, ADSB data, which is broadcast continuously, which is compiled by various sources out there, which provide them freely or almost free to the general public you and I and everyone else would have had an idea of what was the profile of this flight? How fast was it going? How high was it? Was there an erratic uh, departure from the airport or was this a direct departure into a mountain? And certainly the level of information that you had is way greater than 32 years ago. Uh, I wouldn't go to a flight service station and get a briefing from a human being, although there are advantages to that. Way easier to go to my four flight and pull up up to the well, not up to the minute, but you know, recent weather, uh, all the notams, any uh, issues or news that came out about where I'm flying to, where I'm flying from, or where I'm flying over. So I can make those last minute changes and be well informed, at least as well informed as I'm willing to make myself about what I'm facing. And for these two pilots, this was an unfamiliar airport. And if you fly, eventually you will go to an unfamiliar airport because Let's face it, there are thousands of places to take off and land from, and you're not going to go to the same places over and over again. So when you go to someplace that's unfamiliar, take the time to do the research. Look up what you have, talk to your friends, go online, whatever the case may be, to make yourself more comfortable with this situation when you encounter it for the first time. Yeah, flying in and around mountains is hazardous, and we all know that, but do we, do we always give it the proper focus that we need to and judging just by the number of accidents we have in and around mountains i would say that there's a lot of people who don't pay attention to it or, or i get complacent say oh yeah i know about the mountain flying i've flown in this area before and don't take the time to make sure that they're fully aware of every piece that's going on you know it's the pilot's responsibility and i know that you know everything is the pilot's responsibility so you you really got uh sometimes information overload, but you've got to do it. You know, you're gonna save your own butt, you're gonna save back. On this particular airplane, we had the whole band for a, a uh, music uh, celebrity. So the, the entire band was wiped out. And not there's nothing in the report that talks about uh, the weight of the airplane. Did they have all their equipment on the airplane? Some of those equipment is steady. You know, Steve, so what's the airplane uh, at or near gross, which could affect its performance? So there, there's a lot of unanswered questions in this report, but the, the real point is that they flew a good airplane into the mountain. And because they were coming out to the Northeast, could they have asked if they were concerned? Could they have asked for a different runway? Could they have asked for a different vector away from the mountains? You know, just turn west and fly up the coast a little bit? Uh, who knows? Who knows? But the point is, for the pilots are listening to us, it is you've got to be focused on the detail, sometimes right down into the minutia, to make sure that you know exactly what's going on on the flight and, it's, and that you're aware of it and you can take appropriate actions. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about a fun new podcast called So There I Was. If you're a fan of aviation or simply enjoy hearing captivating stories, then this is the podcast for you. Hosted by former Marine pilots Fig and Repeat, this podcast shares first-hand accounts of flying experiences that will have you on the edge of your seat. Whether you're in the mood for something funny, scary, 
poignant or tragic, this podcast has it all. With a relaxed and conversational tone, the pilots share their stories like you're sitting right there with them at the bar after a flight. Hear from fighter pilots, astronauts, blue angels, aircraft carrier captains, Navy and Coast Guard rescue pilots, and many more. Most have survived near-death experiences. Others have overcome incredible disabilities to continue to fly airplanes. You'll hear about heart-pumping moments in the cockpit, hilarious screw-ups during flights, insane hijinks off-duty, and the challenges pilots routinely face. Hear what it feels like to be shot off the bow of a carrier or into space. Experience the terror of landing on a pitching deck on a night so black that the pilot can barely taxi afterwards because his legs are shaking so badly. Hear firsthand how lonely it is to be in the middle of the ocean in a life raft on a dark night in eight-foot seas. Each story is unique and told with a level of detail that will make you feel like you were there. You'll laugh. You'll cry. You'll laugh until you cry. But one thing is certain. You won't be bored. So there I was. It's how all great aviation tales begin. So with that, with Greg not being here, I'm going to do the next to last word. And the next to last word is, uh, no matter how much experience you have, if you feel that you're uncomfortable, that you don't know everything about the situation you're in, just take the time to find out more about it. And by the way, when it comes to mountains, all mountains are not created equal. So if you're used to flying in mountains in Southern California and you're moving to Northern California, there are different things about them, about the weather, about the uh, vegetation, how they look in the sunlight. And definitely in my case, having flown on the East Coast around mountainous areas, it's different from where I am now in Northern California. So whatever lessons I've learned, I'll take them and build on them. And as usual, I'll give the last word, which I feel like a broken record every week. But as I do the reviews for these, for these programs, I see these same things coming up over and over and over again. And the first one that just, just drives me crazy is the lack of pre-planning on some of the pilots that crash. So remember, if you're gonna go flying, start your process before you leave the hotel or you leave your house. Start looking at what's going on, where you're going, what's going on in between, uh, just all the circumstances. When you get to the airport, do it again in detail. All right, make sure you know what's going on. When you go out to your airplane, pre-flight. That's the, the other one I see all the time. All right, make sure you do a good, thorough pre-flight. And if you're afraid you're not doing a good one, or you don't know how to do a good one, get one of the mechanics that works on that airplane, or that type of airplane, and ask them to give you a quick walk around the airplane. What do they look for? And after you do that and you get out in your airplane, make sure you, you look at the cockpit, do a good cockpit check as well switch position and so on. I, I sort of go over that one lightly. But when you get in the air, put that head on a swivel. Especially today, we've got a huge influx of student pilots and with and without instructors. And even with instructors, the number of accidents we've had in the last year with instructors on board and student pilots has been unbelievable. I believe we're up over 150 of them now in less than a year. So, I mean, it's really scary out there. So you've got to pay attention. Unfortunately, most training flights are down low, so get up high quickly. And please, please fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.